Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, Vishnu Pandey, from the Delhi School of Economics, extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, esteemed faculty members, and bright students to this Delhi School of Economics Diamond Jubilee Distinguished Lecture. We are honored to have with us today distinguished speaker Sri Shakti Kanta Das, Honorable Governor, Reserve Bank of India. We look forward to his lecture on this momentous occasion of Teacher's Day as our collective guru on monetary policy making. I would now invite our research scholar, Sujayata Chaudhary, to perform the welcome song followed by the Delhi University Kulgeet. everyone to kindly stand up as the university kulgeet is being performed of Teachers Day, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone and wish you a very happy Teachers Day. May aap sabhi ko shikshak divas ki hard dik shub kaam nai dena chahungi. We begin today's function with this shlok. Guru Re Bhyama, Guru Re Vishnu, Guru Re Devo Maheshwara, Guru Re Sakshat, Thank you, Sujata. I would now like I would now like to invite Professor Pammi Dua, Director, Delhi School of Economics, to deliver the welcome address.
A very good afternoon to everyone here. Respected Shri Shakti Kanta Das, Governor, Reserve Bank of India. Professor Surinder Kumar, Head, Department of Economics. Professor Anandita Datta, Head, Department of Geography. Dr. Kamai Afun, Officiating Head, Department of Sociology. Everyone present here and all those connected online. On this auspicious occasion of the Delhi School of Economics Diamond Jubilee Distinguished Lecture, I warmly welcome all of you to this unique temple of learning par excellence. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our distinguished speaker, Sri Shakti Kanta Das, Governor, Reserve Bank of India, and thank him profusely for gracing this event. I am also pleased to welcome officials from the Reserve Bank of India and the University of Delhi, esteemed colleagues, staff, and students of the Delhi School of Economics. The University of Delhi has recently crossed a significant milestone of 100 years of its momentous existence. Founded on May 1st, 1922, with three colleges and 750 students, the university now includes 90 colleges, 16 faculties, 86 departments, and almost 7 lakh students. In this glorious journey of 100 years of the university, the Delhi School of Economics has entered its 75th year. The Delhi School of Economics, with its constituent departments, Economics, Geography and Sociology is a leading postgraduate institution of academic excellence in India. It also houses the Ratan Tata Library, a premier library in the social sciences. The founder director of the Delhi School of Economics, Professor V.K. R. V. Rao, along with India's first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, President of the Delhi School of Economics Society envisioned an institution that would produce students who could play an important role in the economic development and progress of the country. Professor Rao was also greatly influenced by the teachings of Swami Vivekananda and believed in fostering integrated human development through holistic education. The vision of our founder director was truly actualized through the hard work and earnest engagement of generations of its faculty, non-teaching staff, scholars, students and alumni, who persevered to add glory to the institution and make Delhi School of Economics an exemplar center of excellence for teaching and research. To celebrate the rich legacy of 75 years of excellence, dynamism, and commitment to nurturing purposeful minds of this magnificent institution, the Delhi School of Economics has instituted the Diamond Jubilee Distinguished Lecture Series. We once again warmly welcome today's distinguished speaker, Sri Shakti Kanta Das, of course, he does not require any introduction, but I will say a few words. Sri Shakti Kanta Das, Governor of Reserve Bank of India, has over 42 years of distinguished civil service, primarily in the areas of finance, taxation, investment, and infrastructure. Sri Das possesses a unique combination of experience in both policy formulation and implementation at the highest levels of state and central governments. He has served as Revenue Secretary and as Secretary Economic Affairs Government of India. He also served as a Director in the Central Board of the Reserve Bank of India and on the Board of Securities and Exchange Board of India the regulator for capital markets. 
He represented India in several international forums like the G20, IMF, BRICS and SARC. Shri Das has also served as India's G20 Sherpa and member 15th Finance Commission. As Governor, Reserve Bank of India, he has spearheaded several policy initiatives to support growth and strengthen financial stability in the country. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he steered the Reserve Bank's response through conventional, unconventional and innovative monetary policy and macroprudential measures to mitigate the adverse effects on the economy. If I may also add here that I have had the privilege of working with him as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee as well as in other forums and have learned greatly from my interactions with him, for which I thank him very much. Sridhar was conferred with the Central Bank Governor of the Year Award by Central Banking Publication, United Kingdom, in 2023. He has also been rated A plus by Global Finance Magazine in their Central Bank Report Card 2023. Well, we are students here. We know the meaning of grades, but as governor, he has aced it. So he has A plus. He was also conferred the Central Banker of the Year Asia Pacific 2020 Award by the London-based magazine, The Banker. Banker. We, we warmly congratulate him for his stellar achievements and, and take great pride, pride in, pride in, in welcoming him to the, to the one, one and one, and one only, only Delhi, Delhi School, School of Economics. Thank you, Thank Thank you very you. much. Thank you, ma'am, for your address. I would now request Professor Pamidwa, Director, Delhi School of Economics, to felicitate our distinguished speaker, Shri Shakti Kanta Das. Thank you everyone on the dais. It is now my esteemed pleasure to invite our distinguished speaker, Sri Shakti Kanta Das, to deliver the keynote address on the topic, Art of Monetary Policy Making in the Indian Context. We welcome you, sir. I suppose if I keep it horizontal, it is okay. Where is, huh? I can, yeah. <laughs> Professor Pami Dua, Director, Delhi School of Economics. Professor Surender Kumar, Head, Economics Department, Delhi School. Professor Anindita Datta, Head of the Geography Department. Dr. Kamai Afur, officiating head of Department of Sociology, members of faculty, distinguished guests, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to extend 
very warm greetings to all the teachers and students who are present here on the occasion of the teachers day which is an important event in the calendar of any educational institution and brings back to all of us memories of our days in student days in school or in college and being here in this hall in this auditorium and speaking on uh, on the theme of monetary policy in this vivekananda uh, memorial hall brings back lot of old memories of my student days here in delhi university in the 1970s i have attended in this hall sitting somewhere there so many seminars and so many events so many speeches and uh, it brings back lot of happy memories great memories so it takes me back almost uh, more than uh, four decades and uh, revives lot of uh, pleasant memories i am delighted to be here with all of you to celebrate the diamond jubilee celebrations of the delhi school of economics this school has made a distinct mark as an educational institution of excellence and of uh, a institution of excellence of very high reputation both in india and abroad the list of eminent economists and distinguished alumni associated with the delhi school is long and impressive the school has inspired generations of students to excel in diverse streams such as academia research government and corporate sectors in the reserve bank of india we have also benefited immensely from the delhi school of economics with a continuous stream of students joining the delhi uh, joining the reserve bank of india almost every year it's a matter of pride for me to be part of this momentous year in the history of this great institution which has contributed immensely to the to policy, the policy discourse, discourse of, of india, india. Today, today i have chosen, I have chosen to speak, to speak on, on art of, art of monetary, monetary policy, policy making, making in the, in the indian, indian context. context as you as would be aware, aware india, india formally adopted the flexible, the flexible inflation, inflation targeting framework in 2016, in 2016. in broad, in broad alignment, alignment with, with the prevailing, the prevailing global, global trends the underlying, the underlying principle of this framework, framework is that, is that a, clearly a clearly articulated legislatively mandated numerical, numerical inflation target is the best, is the best foundation, foundation for overall, overall macroeconomic, macroeconomic stability, stability. Low, low and stable, and stable inflation helps households, households and businesses in planning, in planning for, for long term savings and investments, investments which, which ultimately drive innovation, innovation and productivity, productivity and, and sustainable, sustainable growth, growth. On, the on, the con on, the on the contrary high, high and volatile inflation, inflation corrodes the, the economy, economy by, by denting productivity and, and the long term growth, growth potential, potential. Inflation, inflation also affects the poor most negatively I have structured my talk in the following sequence. First, I would like to focus on the evolution of monetary policy in India and this part I will try to be brief because I suppose many of you would be familiar with this. The second part I will focus on key elements of the mon you know inflation inflation uh, uh forecasting framework especially with reference to the forecasting process that the Reserve Bank adopts. the third part would focus more on the practical aspects of conduct of monetary policy under the flexible inflation, inflation targeting regime especially, especially in the recent years, years. And, and finally, finally I, would i would touch upon, upon monetary policy challenges at, at the current, the current juncture. juncture let me let first, first highlight, highlight on evolution, evolution of monetary policy, policy since, since independence. independence and i will, and I will talk, talk about uh, from, from independence, independence till about the global financial, financial crisis broadly, broadly the monetary, the monetary policy, policy evolution in this entire period has seen through four, four stages, stages in very in very broad, broad terms, terms. In, the in the 50s and 60s during, during the five year, five -year plans, plans the focus was on credit planning, planning. then, then the, approach the approach of monetary, of monetary policy changed to she was shifted to monetary uh, targeting which is basically focusing on uh, money circulation and this prevailed from 1985 to 98 the third aspect was the the third approach was the multiple indicator approach from 1998 to 2016 and uh, you know why i mentioned global financial crisis is that the rethink on the approach of monetary policy started with the onset of the global financial crisis in 2008 and from 2018 or 2016 onwards we have the inflation targeting framework as i said during the 50s and 60s 
as the country embarked upon planned economic development monetary policy assumed a developmental role of meeting the credit needs of the economy as identified under the five year plans it was expected that the monetary policy will primarily focus on making credit available for the development of the economy monetary policy during the 70s and 80s was constrained by fiscal dominance automatic monetization of budget deficits and excessive growth of monetary aggregates the large scale deficit financing and the resultant high monetary and credit expansion led to inflationary pressures which were further amplified by a series of shocks at that time namely the indo-pak war of 1971 the drought of 1973 the collapse of the bretton woods system in 1973 and the global oil price shocks of 1973 and 79 these events precipitated the adoption of monetary targeting targeting with feedback as a formal monetary policy framework in 1985 money supply that is m3 became the immediate intermediate target with the objective of controlling inflation This approach to monetary policy was recommended by a committee <coughs> led by none other than Professor Sukhama Chakravarti, a distinguished faculty of the Delhi School of Economics. In this framework, the Reserve Bank aimed at controlling the growth in money supply commensurate with the expected real GDP growth and a tolerable level of inflation. The cash reserve ratio was used as the primary instrument for monetary control with both CRR and the statutory liquidity ratio reaching their peak levels by 1990 due to continued fiscal dominance. The deteriorating external balance position in the backdrop of adverse geopolitical developments and domestic macroeconomic imbalances in the 1980s and the resultant balance of payment crisis in 1991 triggered large scale structural reforms deregulation of the economy financial sector liberalization and a shift towards market determined exchange rate in the wake of the trade and financial sector reforms and the consequent rise in foreign capital flows and financial innovations the efficacy of broad money as an intermediate target came under scrutiny around the mid 1990s At the same time there was a notable shift towards market based financing of for both government and private sector in this environment a multiple indicator approach was adopted in april 1998 as the new framework of monetary policy under this approach a host of indicators constituted the information set used for monetary policy formulation the restrictions on primary financing which was imposed from 1997 onwards the enactment of the fiscal responsibility and the budget management act in 2003 that is the frbm act of 2003 and the consequent introduction of fiscal discipline provided enhanced flexibility to monetary policy increased market orientation of the domestic economy and deregulation of interest rates introduced since early 1990 <coughs> domestic economy and deregulation of interest rates which was introduced also at the same time the multiple indicator approach remained in vogue from 1998-99 till the till the global financial crisis 2008-9 Now during the years following the global financial crisis I now turn to the flexible inflation targeting framework and how it evolved during the years following the global financial crisis in 2008 India witnessed stubbornly high inflation with retail inflation in double digits and growth losing momentum India's macroeconomic fundamentals appeared fragile with widening twin deficits both fiscal and in both fiscal and current accounts and India also witnessed depleting forex reserves the global ripples created by the taper talk of uh, May 2013 and also part of it was in 2000 you know June of 2013 exposed the macroeconomic vulnerabilities of India and the country was identified as one among the fragile five these events called for an evaluation of the multiple indicator approach accordingly 
an expert committee was constituted in the Reserve Bank of India to revise and strengthen the monetary policy framework. The committee recommended a shift to flexible inflation targeting framework, which was formally institutionalized with the amendment of the Reserve Bank of India 1934. And this amendment was done in the parliament in May 2016. Incidentally, I was Secretary of Economic Affairs in the Ministry of Finance at that time, dealing with the adoption of inflation targeting framework. The amended act gives a clear mandate to the Reserve Bank to maintain price stability, keeping in mind the objective of growth. Price stability has been numerically defined as maintaining a headline CPI inflation target of 4% with a tolerance band of 2%, that is plus minus 2% on either side. So it, if it is between 2 to 6%, it's not considered a failure of monetary policy. But the target remains 4% and it is expected, it is mandated that the Reserve Bank should achieve the target of 4%. The tolerance band provides flexibility to accommodate growth and financial stability concerns, supply shocks and measurement and forecast errors. And also, uh, uh, you know, and also on any unforeseen development that may happen as we witnessed in the recent years. The target is set by the government of India in consultation with the Reserve Bank every five years. So for the first part, you know, from 2016 to 2021, the target was five years. I mean, the target was 4%. And thereafter, the same target has been renewed for the subsequent five years. Another major change with the amendment of the Reserve Bank of India Act in 2016 was the shift from a governor-centric, that is the RBI governor-centric monetary policy, policy decision-making process to a collegial decision-making body in the form of the Monetary Policy Committee. The Monetary Policy Committee or MPC as it is commonly known is interested with the responsibility of deciding the policy repo rate with the objective of achieving the inflation target keeping in mind the objective of growth. I am happy to recall that uh, Professor Pamidua was an esteemed member of the first uh, uh, MPC and the Reserve Bank benefited immensely from her distinguished academic rigor and practical insights. I am also happy to see in the audience uh, Professor Chetan Ghate who is uh, here and he was also a member of the first monetary policy committee you know, from 2016 onwards. The decisions of the MPC are taken by a majority of votes among the members present. In the event of a tie, the governor has a second vote or a casting vote. After the conclusion of, of every monetary policy meeting, the Reserve Bank publishes the resolution adopted by the Monetary Policy Committee. In addition, the governor's statement and press briefings are the other modes of policy communication. The minutes of each of the members of MPC are also published exactly after two weeks of the conclusion of the Monetary Policy Committee meeting and that is done, that is provided for in the law in the interest of greater transparency. Similarly, every six months, the Reserve Bank comes out with a monetary policy report which broadly captures the way the monetary policy has evolved, the way the macroeconomic situation has evolved over the previous six months. Now, all these provisions add to transparency of the whole process and better communication of the whole process. Now, this is a forward-looking monetary policy and uh, which has therefore uh, you know, underlying which is the importance of uh, forecasting. So I would now like to therefore focus on aspects of the forward-looking monetary policy and the importance of forecasting. As monetary policy works with long and variable lags, the forecasts of key economic variables play a vital role in the conduct of monetary policy. It is for this reason that inflation targeting framework is also termed as inflation forecast targeting framework. To take a real life analogy, the conduct of monetary policy is, live, is like driving a car on a road with potential ditches and speed bumps. The driver needs to see them ahead and in time to regulate the speed of his car. Yes, to regulate the speed of his car and to negotiate the ditch or the speed bump 
smoothly. If the driver reacts suddenly to a speed bump, he runs the risk of losing control and causing, and, ca causing an accident. Therefore, a successful conduct of monetary policy depends critically on credible forecasts of key variables like inflation and growth. In other words, monetary policy has to be forward-looking. Rear-view mirror can lead to policy errors. The forecasting process followed at the Reserve Bank has three broad uh, components. They are nowcasting, short-term forecasting, and medium-term forecasting. Am I making sense? Or should I, I mean, switch over to, uh, is it okay? Okay, <laughs> right. The first component of nowcasting or uh, the first component of now casting, you, uh, the first component of these three approaches, that is now casting, it uses high frequency coincident indicators for the current month or the quarter that are available ahead of the official data releases on inflation and growth. This is augmented with informed judgment based on extensive discussions with subject area experts, forward-looking surveys which the Reserve Bank conducts from time to time, and market intelligence. The second component comprises short-term forecasts for up to one year. These are generated from semi-structural models that employ three time series and econometric methods using aggregate and disaggregated data and information from forward-looking surveys and lead indicators. The third component involves generating medium-term forecasts and alternate scenarios using what we call the QPM, that is the quarterly projection model. This framework has been widely accepted, that is the QPM framework has been widely accepted and adopted by modern central banks operating under the flexible inflation targeting regime. Its main purpose is to generate medium-term projections and policy analysis consistent with achieving the inflation target or the mandate set under the inflation targeting framework. Each of these three components which I mentioned, that is the now casting, the medium-term forecast and the QPM model, each of these three components, they have different forecasting horizons and hence different approaches. These forecasts therefore become the backbone of the monetary policy decision-making process. I would now like to turn to conduct of monetary policy under the flexible inflation targeting framework. And here, let me highlight the following points. Now, I would like to sort of uh, highlight here how the monetary policy, tar you know, the inflation targeting framework, uh, how it has been used from 2016 onwards, especially the period when the growth seemed to be slowing down in 2019. In view of the tepid growth outlook for 2019-20, the Monetary Policy Committee, that is MPC, moved into a rate easing cycle from February 2019 to stimulate economic activity. During February to October 2019, the policy repo rate was reduced by 135 basis points from 6.5% to 5.5%. One five percent. Also, the stance of monetary policy was changed from neutral to accommodative in June 2019. If you, if some of you or if all of you have seen the resolution of the monetary policy, there are broadly two major announcements which we make. One is what is the policy repo rate, whether we are increasing it, reducing it, or we are maintaining uh, status quo, maintaining status quo. The other thing which we say was what is the stance of monetary policy. And the st stance of monetary policy basically reflects the approach of the monetary policy and how it sees the you know what is his broad, broad approach in current times at the current you know at present and how it sees the next few months and what would be its overall approach so therefore when usually when we are in a rate tightening cycle it's called uh, you know it's in a tightening mode when we are in a rate easing cycle it, we are in an accommodative mode and there is something called the neutral stance also, which is neither accommodative nor tightening, which basically means that you are, you know, it is wait and watch. At the moment, our monetary policy stance is withdrawal of accommodation. I will talk about it, uh, you know, more later. In uh, effective October, that is effective from 1st October 2019, 
the external benchmark based lending rate system was also introduced which quickened the pace of policy transmission into lending rates so what we mandated is that the banks when they extend loans particularly to certain sectors like retail loans msme loans or housing sector loans it has to be benchmarked to either a government security of you know either the treasury bills or government security of 10 10 years government security or a government security of equivalent maturity let us say if you are giving a 3 year loan what is the you know what is the interest rate prevailing the market rate the yield prevailing in the market for a 3 year uh, loan i mean for a 3 year government security so your lending rate is linked to that and this was done in october 2019 primarily to ensure better transmission of monetary policy to actual lending rates by the banks now when the covid-19 pandemic hit india the monetary policy responded swiftly by reducing the policy repo rate sizably by 115 basis points in a span of 2 months that is during march to may 2020 in parallel the reserve bank infused large amounts of liquidity through both conventional and unconventional measures to stimulate the economy restore confidence and revive market activity while ensuring that these measures did not engender future fragilities overall liquidity enhancing measures worth rupees 17.2 trillion that is 17.2 lakh crores or 8.7% of gdp were announced during the covid period all these measures were taken in view of the large output losses although pandemic induced supply disruption and demand mismatches pushed inflation levels higher than 4% the flexibility embedded in the inflation targeting framework enabled the monetary policy committee to take these measures to safeguard the economy and the financial sector from the debilitating impact of the pandemic the in october 2020 the reserve bank noted that a stable and orderly evolution of the yield curve was a public good because i had said earlier that you know it the, most of the bonds in the private sector or the you know most of the lending is actually linked to the you know is actually linked to the interest rates prevailing the market rates prevailing on the various government securities so therefore what is critical is whether your bond rates that is the government bond rates how whether they are high or low and how they are because all the lending rates in the market whether through corporate bonds or other kinds of bonds they are benchmarked to the prevailing yields or the prevailing interest rates the market interest rates on uh, government securities so in reserve bank uh, you know in august october 2020 we noted that a stable and orderly evolution of the yield curve was a public good the benefit of which accrues to the stakeholders in the financial system since you would be aware that uh, you know a central bank like japan for example they have a stated policy of what is called yield curve control their monetary intervention their monetary decisions of their uh, you know the central bank of japan bank of japan their decisions primarily target on controlling the yield on the government securities we are not in that uh, we we don't adopt that approach but during that period of covid when it was absolutely necessary to ensure that uh, you know whatever monetary policy which we were taking and uh, that was transmitted to the market it was absolutely also necessary that uh, we maintain the yield curve of government securities in a manner that government borrowing also goes through smoothly as well as whatever are the interest rates set by the mpc are actually transmitted to the market and it was necessary in the kind of extraordinary circumstances which we encountered during the covid-19 period but yield targeting of yield uh, yield targeting is not a part of our policy in normal times it was only for a temporary period that we gave a forward guidance wherein we only said that it is a public good the benefit of which generally accrues to all stakeholders in the financial system since monetary policy transmission through the regular interest rate channel was impeded because of inadequate credit demand during the pandemic as i mentioned a little while ago the reserve bank activated 
the asset price channel through large scale purchases of government paper through open market operations what we call omos and secondary market government securities acquisition program what we call gsap this was again an innovative thing which we did and rbi had never done never earmarked a part of its balance sheet for purchase of government uh, securities the idea is that we purchase the government securities with two objectives that to infuse liquidity into the system and number two to ensure that the yield curve on government securities that also evolves in an orderly manner large purchases of government paper softened the gsec yields which in turn facilitated the lowering of the yields that is the interest rates on all instruments priced off the yield curve the pandemic induced liquidity measures were that we undertook in india by the reserve bank were unique in several ways why i am saying unique is that it is unique compared to the approach which was uh, you know approach which was adopted by most of the central banks around the world especially the advanced country central banks and uh, our decisions and policy was unique in several ways uh, let me list them out number 1 liquidity was provided only through reserve banks counterparties for on lending to stressed entities and sectors in that sense most of it was targeted and not open ended in other words when we injected liquidity through the banking system it was specified that it is targeted towards the msmes or it is targeted towards the you know small size nbfc so it was targeted it was not open ended because if you just you know if you just in an open ended manner you indu you know you just put in liquidity into the system it can create asset price bubbles which can again backfire and which can you know hit you back so therefore whatever liquidity we injected they were targeted and uh, they were also provided through reserve banks counterparties that is mostly banks and uh, uh, banks and all india financial institutions like the nabard the sidbi and the national housing bank uh, the second uniqueness about our approach was that asset uh, purchases pro program that is gsap government security acquisition program was announced for a limited period of 6 months and was much smaller in size than advanced economies and this was confined to government securities in the secondary market third collateral standards were not diluted in the lending facilities four loan resolution frameworks for covid 19 related stressed assets of banks and nbfcs you know we announced a regulatory framework for treatment of the uh, stressed assets of the banks because we announced a moratorium on repayment of bank loans for 6 months and then because of the covid pressure and because of a stoppage of economic activity naturally the the you know the loan terms and conditions of large number of loans had to be restructured so while doing that also the re loan resolution framework or what you call the loan restructuring framework that also they were uh, not open ended and they were subject to achievement of certain financial and operational parameters this is something which we learned from past experience because in the past experience most of the uh, restructuring framework which were announced uh, by the reserve bank you know this kind of parameters and guard rails were not imposed as a result you know it was found later on that the restructurings were done for periods or for you know the installments were fixed in a manner which were highly impractical and not at all feasible leading ultimately leading eventually to a you know amounting size of non performing assets or what we call stressed loans or bad loans so learning from past experience this time our resolution framework was not open ended but we impose that after restructuring this is the kind of financial parameter this is the kind of operational parameter the business entity should achieve and five most of the liquidity injection measures had pre announced sunset clauses which helped in an orderly unwinding of liquidity on their respective terminal dates without de-anchoring market expectations you see it's much easier to infuse liquidity into the system but it's very difficult to pull it back because the market gets used to it every economic player in the market everybody gets used to it and then suddenly when you squeeze it 
then it becomes uh, you know it creates a lot of disruption in the financial system and also for central banks it becomes a very difficult decision to take to decide on the timing of withdrawal so all most of our liquidity injection measures were announced for one year period or three years so that the you know the banks and the other borrowers who avail this liquidity they knew that they have to return it in one year or in three years now this enabled them to plan their activities in a manner which will enable them to return that liquidity return that money to the central bank that is to the reserve bank after one year or three years and uh, so therefore that is something which uh, reserve bank uh, we did and it in that sense it was quite unique because most of the advanced country uh, you know advanced country central banks injected liquidity and uh, later on it becomes very difficult to withdraw it and we are currently witnessing it with many advanced uh, economies uh, central banks still trying to you know take out the liquidity and when they are now trying to take out the liquidity we are hit by fresh crisis arising from the ukraine war and now you know with all that is happening around the world so therefore our a copy of this speech will be uploaded in the rbi website so you can have a look at it so basically what i'm saying is that going by past experience and working as a team the reserve bank was able to you know we were able to sort of uh, adopt a completely unique and innovative approach which has enabled the reserve bank to sort of roll back the covid time special measures which were undertaken and unless you roll them back in time it will it will sort of undermine financial stability and that is one of the fundamental reasons for the fact why we have uh, there are other factors also but this is also one of the reasons for the fundamental reasons for why uh, for reasons uh, as to why we see financial stability banking sector stability on and overall macroeconomic stability in our uh, economy now the let me now focus on the global upsurge in inflation and monetary tightening cycle i talked about the covid period now let me move to the post covid uh, period uh, in early 2022 inflation in india was expected to moderate significantly uh, with a projected average rate of 4.5% in 22 23 this was premised upon an anticipated normalization of supply chains the gradual ebbing of covid-19 infections and a normal monsoon such expectations were however belied by the outbreak of hostilities in ukraine in february 2022 initially the shocks came from food and fuel prices which were mainly global in origin but local factors from adverse weather events also played an important role in stoking food inflation last year you remember in march april we had suddenly a severe heat wave as a result of which there was a you know there was a large scale failure of the wheat crop and that added to you know that was one of the major domestic factors which contributed to food inflation in particular now the shocks to inflation all these shocks to go inflation got increasingly generalized over the next few months under these circumstances the monetary policy quickly changed gears by prioritizing inflation ahead of growth in april last year that is in april 2022 and changed the stance of monetary policy from uh, accommodative accommodative stance to withdrawal of accommodation in june 2022 so this is what i had referred to earlier now the stance of monetary policy is withdrawal of accommodation in an off cycle meeting in may 2022 that is last year the mpc raised the policy rate by 40 basis points this was followed by rate hikes of varying sizes in each of the five subsequent meetings till february this year in all the policy repo rate has been raised by 250 basis points cumulatively between may last year to february 2023 the quantum of rate hike was calibrated keeping in view the changing inflation outlook we have maintained a pause in april june and recently in august meetings of the mpc as we feel that the 200 basis points hike is still working its way through the system headline inflation had eased to 4.8% in june 23 from the peak of 7.8% in april 
2022 that is april 2022 it however surged to 7.4% in july mainly on account of a spurt in vegetable prices which have already of course started moderating as i noted in my monetary policy statement on 10th august 23 that is uh, last month given the likely short term nature of vegetable price shocks monetary policy can await the dissipation of the first round effects of such shocks which may produce short lived spikes in headline inflation we remain on guard to ensure that the second order effects in the form of generalization and persistence are not allowed to take hold the frequent incidences of recurring food price shocks pose a risk to anchoring of inflation expectations which has been underway since february 2022 we will remain watchful of this aspect also the role of continued and timely supply side interventions as is being undertaken by the government assumes criticality in limiting the severity and duration of such food and such food price shocks in these circumstances it is necessary to be watchful of any risk to price stability and act timely and appropriately we remain firmly focused on aligning inflation to the target of 4% let me now turn to the last part of my uh, lecture which uh, highlights uh, which focuses on policy issues and challenges which uh, we are confronted with the current episode of high global inflation and the preceding preceding overlapping shocks of the pandemic and the russia ukraine war have raised significant issues and challenges for the conduct of monetary policy first the flexible inflation targeting framework and the target of 4% was put to test given the multiple challenges faced by the economy due to the pandemic so when the inflation target was to be reviewed in early 2021 and notified for the next 5 years the reserve bank reiterated and recommended for retention of the 4% target it was stressed that the target and flexibility built around it had helped the reserve bank to support the economy when required and shift gears and reprioritize inflation over growth if inflation became high and breached the upper tolerance level of 6% in fact this is precisely what happened when there was a sudden surge in inflationary pressures following the war in ukraine the pursuit of flexible inflation targeting and the you know the maintenance of the 4% target demonstrated our commitment to price stability and enhanced the credibility of monetary policy when i say credibility of monetary policy i basically mean that it also helps to anchor inflation expectations of the of businesses and of households and of everyone in the economy because if the central bank says that i am okay with a higher inflation level then naturally people start expecting business start expecting that the prices will go up and actually you know it materializes in terms of rise in prices so reiteration by the central bank that we are committed to 4% as we have been doing time and again and the fact that we again recommended to government despite the fact that you know inflation was prevailing at that time uh, upwards of 5% and touching 6 and sometimes above 6 the fact that the you know the reserve bank recommended 4% and stuck to that target also established the credibility of the monetary policy framework and also gave confidence to the market and also helped in anchoring inflation expectations the second challenge which monetary policy faces is the level of liquidity in the system and the important role uh, it plays in determining the actual overnight call money rates or the weighted average call money rate wacr which is the operating target you see when we announce the monetary policy the expectation is that it will transmit to the actual lending rates in the economy but the actual success of the monetary policy is measured in terms of the overnight call money rates and of course later on the how whether the rate is transmitting into the bank loans and to the other loans which are taking place in the mark which are you know which are being loans which are granted in the system in by banks or nbfcs but primary instrument you know primary measure of success of monetary policy is you know uh, monetary policy reflects itself in the overnight call rates or what we call the wacr that is the 
weighted average uh, call money rates which is the operating target of monetary policy so the operating target the overnight call rates should ideally be the same as the you know as the policy repo rate if the policy repo rate is 6.5% then by and large the wacr that is the overnight call rates also should be around uh, you know, six and a half percent. Now, monetary policy, our policy rate is six and a half, six point five. So, the overnight call rates also should be around six point five percent. Now, the MPC decides the policy repo rate and the stance of monetary policy. Thereafter, it is the Reserve Bank's responsibility to conduct its liquidity management operations in consonance with the decision of the MPC. During the pandemic, while the MPC reduced policy repo rate by 115 basis points within a span of two months, the Reserve Bank infused significant quantum of liquidity, driving the overnight call money rates closer to the reverse repo rate. That is, you know, less than the repo rate. Repo rate that time was 5.15%, but the reverse repo rate was 3.35%. Because we infused you know, large quantum of liquidity in the system, the overnight call rates were hovering around 3 to, you know, 3.3 or 3.35 uh, percent. And it was done by design to ensure that, uh, you know, the actual uh, overnight call rates are low and that the actual affordability of businesses to avail credit also is improved to that extent. Now, this was done to stimulate the economy, restore confidence and revise and revive market activity in consonance with the accommodative stance of monetary policy. As the MPC's focus shifted to withdrawal of accommodation last year in June, uh, in the wake of surge in inflation following the commencement of war in Ukraine, the Reserve Bank's liquidity management operations focused even more on gradual and calibrated withdrawal of surplus liquidity in a non-disruptive manner. Actually, we had, uh, you know, because of the preset dates by which, you know, that is the one year or three year period for which the liquidity was injected, already in the, you know, in the self, in the automatic mode, liquidity was coming back. Besides that, from 2021 onwards, we had also introduced something called the, you know, the variable rate reverse repo operations. I am not going to detail into it. It is there explained in a footnote of this paper. You can uh, refer to it. So when uh, the withdrawal of accommodation became the stance of monetary policy last year in June, we also renewed our efforts and uh, started pulling out liquidity even more. And this was done in a very non-disruptive manner. The objective was to reduce the size of the liquidity surplus in the system to a level consistent with the prevailing stance of monetary policy. Overall, liquidity management by the Reserve Bank has been nimble-footed and agile while responding to evolving circumstances. The third aspect, the third challenge which we, you know, which we face is, uh, and which is something which we have learned and which our experience has shown, is that uh, uh, our experience in recent years shows that supply shocks have become more frequent with profound implications for inflation management and anchoring of inflation expectations. A key risk of sustained high inflation is that it can de-anchor inflation expectations. It is therefore important to remain vigilant and take necessary steps in a calibrated and timely manner to keep expectations firmly anchored. The Reserve Bank has been quick and calibrated while navigating through such turbulences. We look through fleeting shocks but remain prepared to undertake policy responses if such shocks show signs of persistence and getting generalized. In such a scenario, monetary policy has to focus on containing the second round effects. Fourth, price stability and financial stability are complementary to each other. In fact, price stability is an anchor for financial stability. But sometimes the trade-off between the two becomes a close call, as demonstrated in the recent banking sector turmoil in some advanced economies. You had the, we had the, you know, we witnessed the failure of uh, a few, you know, few commercial banks in the United States and the failure of the Credit Suisse, I mean, which is a large institution in uh, Switzerland. Now, after, near, after a near zero policy rate for a prolonged period, 
Central banks in these economies started raising interest rates aggressively in 2022, which contributed to stress in certain banks in these economies. In contrast, our battle against inflation is not constrained by financial stability concerns. In fact, even during the COVID phase, we continuously took measures to strengthen financial stability. The Reserve Bank has adopted a prudent approach and taken a number of initiatives to revamp regulation and supervision of banks, NBFCs, that is non-banking finance companies, and other financial entities by developing an integrated and harmonized architecture. Our banking system remains resilient and healthy with improved capital ratios, asset quality, and profitability. Fifth, central bank communication play, plays a very vital role in on-ground efficacy of monetary policy. A few decades ago, central banks believed that they should be, I quote, shrouded in mystery, again I quote, say as little as possible, and say cryptically. Former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, had famously remarked, if I seem to be unduly clear to you, I repeat, if I seem, that is, I'm quoting Alan Greenspan, if I seem unduly clear to you, you must have misunderstood what I said. Those times are gone. Now, managing expectations through effective communication is a vital instrument in the monetary policy toolkit. In the case of Reserve Bank, effective forward guidance during the easing cycle reinforced, uh, reinforced the effective uh, uh, reinforced the impact of our conventional and unconventional measures during the pandemic. At the height of the pandemic during 2020 and 21, the MPC prioritized growth over inflation. In fact, when inflation was above the upper tolerance level of 6% in July-August 2020, we provided both state and time-based forward guidance of continuing with accommodative stance of monetary policy as output remained well below its pre-pandemic levels. Besides, our forecast also showed that inflation was likely to soften gradually. In the second half of 2021, inflation eased in line with our assessment. In the tightening phase, which commenced in April-May 2022, that is April-May last year, the scale and nature of communication has been appropriately fine-tuned and calibrated to ensure successful transmission of policy rate hikes. The focus has been on anchoring of inflation expectations by emphasizing our firm commitment to realign inflation with the target. Overall, central bank communication has to be balanced. Too much of it may confuse the market, while too little may keep it guessing. We trade a very fine line and constantly endeavor to refine our communication strategies. Now, let me conclude by saying that monetary policy framework in India has evolved in line with the developments in theory and country practices. The changing nature of the economy and developments in financial markets. Within the broad objectives, the relative emphasis on inflation, growth and financial stability has varied across monetary policy regimes since independence. Our experience during the inflation targeting regime provides some useful lessons for conduct of monetary policy. First, being proactive and nimble-footed during a crisis gives one the ability to respond speedily to fast-paced and overwhelming developments. Second, Policy measures should be prudent, targeted, and calibrated to the need of the hour without being tied down by any, any existing dogma or orthodoxy. Third, monetary policy actions, when needed, should be backed up by appropriate regulatory and supervisory measures, including macroprudential instruments, to reinforce the policy impact and its credibility. Fourth, Guidance and confidence need to be provided to the market and the wider public through effective communication as part of the endeavor to anchor inflation expectations and sentiments appropriately. All these principles were firmly embedded in our actions during the multiple shocks in the recent period. Alan Blinder, who wrote, uh, Alan Blinder, who wore both 
heads of uh, both the heads of being an academician and a practitioner once said once said i quote having looked at monetary policy from both sides now i can testify that central banking in practice is as much as an is as much an art as science unquote as students of economics at this prestigious delhi school of economics i am sure you are well versed with the science of monetary policy as a macro stabilization tool i took this opportunity to throw some light on the art of monetary policy making from a practitioner's perspective especially in a dynamic and uncertain environment as we witnessed in recent years as we continue our journey ahead we remain clear in our focus flexible in our approach and determined in our efforts to strengthen india's macroeconomic fundamentals and support its growth story i'll stop here thank you very much for your hearing thank you very much sir for this address we now move to an interactive session full of questions and answers with our distinguished speaker and i request professor pammi dubar to take it forward thank you very much for an excellent exposition of the developments in monetary policy over the years and how monetary policy has successfully been applied to combat crises of various kinds as well as combat inflation and how india has come out to be a role model for other countries in terms of monetary policy making and i think you have summed it up very well in saying that the art of monetary policy lies in adopting a scientific approach to monetary policy so i am sure that our students here would have understood the lecture very well so i will now open the floor to questions we don't have a lot of time and i will take about uh, two or three questions so those who would like to ask some questions can raise their hands uh, Yeah, some students first. I would like to see hands from students. Then we can move to faculty. Okay, uh, if you someone can give the mic there, please give your name and also the program you have enrolled in here. Good evening, sir. Thank you for the lecture. Good evening sir thank you for the lecture i am simarleen kaur a second year student of masters in economics here as you mentioned monetary policy has been our guide to get out from financial crises and the things that we've been witnessing for a while and with g20 approaching what would you say is india's financial stability position relative to other g20 countries can we expect any formative changes in the near future is so far as our financial sector is concerned i have said it uh, multiple times uh, elsewhere it is resilient and stable despite multiple shocks you know the covid 19 even before the covid period the growth was uh, gdp growth was moderating then we had the sudden shock of covid 19 something which we had not seen in last 100 years followed by the ukraine war and then the synchronized monetary policy tightening by almost every central bank in the world and the pressure on the financial markets and on the banking system through all these multiple crises and all these overlapping shocks our uh, financial sector consisting of the banking sector the nbfcs and other financial entities they have remained resilient and stable and that is thanks to the approach which uh, the central bank that is rbi has taken and also the kind of uh, fiscal support which uh, came from government which was again very calibrated and uh, uh, targeted uh you know fiscal support which was extended by the government our financial sector uh, remains stable so far as other countries are concerned there were some uh, ripples uh when uh, the united states uh, you know the american banks faced uh, three three or four of the banks failed their credit suisse is a huge institution and uh, there are underlying vulnerabilities almost you know in many countries price stability is the main challenge which is really 
uh, at the core of uh, financial stability. Unless you have price stability, uh, you know, you cannot have a finan stable financial sector. High inflation is something which almost every economy is encountering. In India, our inflation had come down, but then because of the food price shocks, it has again gone up. We expect the inflation level to start moderating from the current month onwards. That is our projection. So far as other countries are concerned, they are uh, still their inflation levels are well above uh, the target. The target in advanced countries is usually 2%, but the inflation remains uh, upwards of uh, 3%. In the, whether it is the European Union or uh, the e, you know UK or US or you know other countries, so therefore I think in a comparative sense today India is uh, better placed. The balance sheets of our banks are strong. We have a twin balance sheet uh, advantage. I mentioned about a twin balance sheet uh, problem earlier, which was basically the balance sheet of banks and the you know the balance sheet, the fiscal deficit. You know, that uh, I talked about uh, the fiscal deficit at the current account, the twin deficit problem. So we had uh, the, you know, we had the fiscal deficit, we had the current account uh, deficit, high current account deficit. Now we have what is called a twin balance sheet, uh, you know, advantage. That is the balance sheets of corporates are, you know, have been deleveraged substantially and the balance sheet of banks are also solid. So therefore, in a comparative sense, our financial sector is uh, definitely better placed. And I mentioned also the capital adequacy, the uh, capital adequacy or the level of the stressed assets, the NPAs, what we call. In all parameters, our banking sector is, uh, you know, reporting good results. Thank you very much. Another question from a student. Yes, if the mic can be given there. And please introduce yourself first. Um, good evening, sir. Thank you for the lecture. My name is Aditi Jain, and I'm enrolled in the Masters in Economics program here. <coughs> sir, you talked about the spike in vegetable prices that we've experienced in recent times, especially with the surge in the price of tomato recently. Um, sir, how does the uh, RBI decide when it's the right time to intervene in such circumstances and what sort of a monetary policy stance does it take? You see, as I said, uh, monetary policy has to be forward looking. Monetary policy, you know, you, uh, you not only, I mean, you look at the current state, there is an outcasting I talked about, you look about the current uh, situation with regard to price stability, that is inflation. But you also look beyond six months up to let's say one year. How the, you know, as per the current state of affairs, as per the current situation, and the other trends which are visible, which are likely to unfold, which are likely to happen, we make a, for we make a forecast. Forecast about the likely inflation 12 months from now, six months from now. So based on that, we decide our monetary policy. Now, for example, when the, you know, in India, what they call the top prices have always been challenged. That is tomato, onion, and potato. Uh, last few years, if you see, it is the top vegetables. These three, which, uh, you know, because of weather-related events and other things, they create a lot of uh, challenge to inflation. This time, it was the turn of the tomatoes. And when the tomato prices went up, naturally, it... Uh, transmitted to the prices of other vegetables. So primarily due to tomato price increasing by more than 200% and the increase in other uh, you know, prices of other vegetables, the inflation spiked. But our assessment shows, and past experience, there are also preceding uh, experience also, that and our experience shows and our assessment for the current year is that this uh, vegetable price inflation would not last more than uh, two, two and a half months. And in fact, as uh, you would be knowing, or let me share with you, the prices of most of the vegetables have started uh, coming down. Tomato prices have really come down very steeply and are expected to go down further. So if there is a sudden spike in vegetable prices and we see that it is likely to moderate, it is likely to go down in two months, we don't change our monetary policy. We decide to look through it. We decided we decide to look through it, but we maintain a very careful watch. 
we see whether this is transmitting to other areas of headline inflation that is other areas of food inflation whether vegetable inflation is permeating into other aspects of food inflation and to the broader headline inflation if we find going forward that this is transmitting to other to other vegetable to other food items if we see that this is getting generalized and this is getting persistent meaning it is continuing then that would be the time to act but when our assessment is that the current vegetable price inflation is going to be short lived a matter of 2 months or 2 and 1/2 months max then we don't change our monetary policy because ahead we expect at the end of the year inflation to be about 5.1 or 5.2 is what we have uh, projected so therefore we decided to tolerate it see how it evolves and then decide on the next course of action right uh, thank you for this uh, very uh, informative Yeah okay so thanks for this informative answer we'll take the last question preferably from a student okay we have two so maybe we'll take two so we'll start from my right side if you please introduce yourself first thank you sir for this insightful session i am swasti mishra second year master student from the department of economics my question is that upi has been a remarkable movement in the context of india how can rbi and the government increase its penetration especially in the rural areas and what have been the biggest uh, roadblocks in upi implementation and penetration is this is uh, one of the high priority areas this is a priority for the reserve bank and also a priority for the government and uh, we want to today upi is available i think country wide it is available but still there is considerable scope still there is lot of uncovered distance to cover you have number one the aspect of uh, connectivity you know that is uh, mobile connectivity or the internet connectivity that is one uh, aspect so therefore there are shadow areas where internet connectivity is poor or it is uh, not there particularly in the extremely remote areas etc so on the one hand the government is focusing on what is called the spreading the bharat net that is you know throughout the country they are laying these optical fiber cables to make internet available throughout the country including the remote areas so far as reserve bank is concerned we are now you know we have launched uh, recently methods of uh, you know using making upi payments in areas where there is no internet facility or where internet facility is poor by a system of creating a wallet facility in the mobile phone that is you load a certain amount to your you know amount of money create a wallet a digital wallet which you can operate through your mobile phone and you can do a transaction with the merchant and when you come to the you know an area where the uh, let us say the internet connectivity is better immediately it uh, you know your uh, sort of that uh, in any case wallet is a money which you have already drawn it's like you are keeping it in your purse so and you have made payment by using your mobile phone and the merchant also will have you know way of uh, sort of uh, uh, when he goes to a near nearby area so he'll be able to get that uh, cash into his account the other challenge has been that uh, still there are large number of uh, so first thing i said is internet connectivity on which both government and the rbi are working government is extending the you know the internet connectivity throughout the country and rbi is introducing new this kind of innovative methods the second area is that still we have large number of uh, feature phones that is not smart smartphones but the old type Uh, push button phones usually you know they are not uh, conventionally they are not compliant uh, to upi but that has now been enabled through technology we have enabled uh, you know feature phones also to make uh, payments that is the second area and uh, uh, so it is a question of time people are getting used to it you will be amazed to see the you know the level of interest that you see even in uh, semi urban or even in rural areas the level of interest and the pride which people take in using a qr code and the mobile phone and making the payment and getting a message it gives a sense of pride and a sense of uh, you know 
uh, I'm not exaggerating, but a sense of power, you know, look, I made my payment through the mobile phone. So it's a matter of time. UPI has become an international model now. It is, you know, everybody in the G20 discussions over the last one year I have seen, there is a lot of interest across the world. And we are now trying to connect, uh, you know, make, develop interoperability between our UPI and similar systems in other countries. We have already launched that with uh, Singapore. So Singapore's uh, pay now and India's UPI are now interoperable. We are working with a few other countries also uh, to make it uh, interoperable. So with regard to challenges, I broadly explained these are the two. And third is the people's uh, knowledge, invol involvement, uh, you know, for which we are doing a lot of advertisements, a lot of uh, not just advertisements in the television channels in some high profile, uh, you know, events like the IPL or the uh, one day cricket or T20. But we also do a lot of advertisement through the local FM channels, through vernacular newspapers, through awareness campaigns, which uh, the RBI and the banks together we organize in uh, smaller localities in rural areas. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was truly enlightening. It's Teacher's Day, and we everyone is here to serve the students, and sir has uh, very generously agreed for that. So please introduce yourself. Thank you, thank you, sir, for the lesson today. I'm a research assistant here at the Delhi School of Economics. I'm Shohan Mukherjee. Uh, my question to you is, uh, in June of 2022, the RBI published a report, a s uh, study of the states, a risk analysis, detailing the contingent liabilities facing the states. Um, given the lack of a bankruptcy code for the states, given the implications for sovereign debt, could you shed some light on what role the RBI plays in looking at the financial stability of the states? Thank you. Is what you are referring to is the fiscal stability of uh, the states. There, the Reserve Bank, uh, you know, we it is for the government of India, you know, in the sense that the first thing is it is the responsibility of each state to be fiscally prudent, to be fiscally responsible. I'm not implying otherwise, so let me qualify by saying that I'm by no means saying that states, I'm not making a generalized statement that states are not fiscally prudent, but I'm saying that that is the first requirement for any state to be fiscally prudent. And again, let me emphasize for the benefit of our, uh, my, you know, a few friends from media, don't take it otherwise. I'm not saying that, <laughs> you know, I don't want to see a headline tomorrow, RBI governor says that states are imprudent. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, the first requirement is that the responsibility of the, st is the responsibility of states to be fiscally prudent. And most and almost every state has enacted the FRBM Act. There are state level FRBM Acts. The states have also uh, their own uh, debt uh, to GSDP targets. The states also have uh, their, you know, m mandated limits on the up level up to which they can create contingent liabilities. That is the level up to which they can give state government guarantees. The second aspect is uh, there is a provision in the Constitution, Article 293.3, under which the central government gives permission to the states to borrow from the market. Every year they have to take the permission. And uh, so under that, the government of India uh, always uh, takes, uh, you know, focuses on ensuring that the states stick to their uh, fiscal deficit. So far as the Reserve Bank is concerned, we are the bankers to the state and to the central governments. And uh, from time to time, our researchers come out with various articles on various aspects of the economy, not just on state finances, but also on central finances, also on the uh, banking sector, on so many other. Every month, around 15th of the month, you would see a, a series of bulletin articles which are published by our researchers. These papers do not reflect the official view of the RBI. It is the view of the researchers. And they do analysis, so similarly this report was published uh, last year, fiscal analysis of uh, risk analysis of state finances, where we have listed out, given the data, which are the states which are most uh, stressed in terms of uh, their uh, size of debt, and uh, what are the potential uh, sort of risks to state finances in the coming years. We have identified some four or five uh, uh, you know, areas which can pose big risk to state finances. The objective is primarily to sensitize the states that these are the areas of concern and impress upon them 
that they need to look at this. And we have every year a conference of state uh, uh, finance secretaries, which is held in RBI. And we sense it's our, you know, as the banker to the state, state governments, it's our job and uh, it is, our, you know, there's an expectation that we should sensitize them also about the potential risks and that's what we do. Thank you. very much for an excellent interactive session with our students and I'm sure that they will cherish this experience interacting with you and sharing uh, their experiences with research and doing their masters here with you so thank you very much this is very special to our students thank you I would now like to call upon Professor Surinder Kumar, Head of Department, Department of Economics, to deliver the vote of thanks. So, good afternoon, respected distinguished guests and speaker of today, Sri Sakti Kanta Das, Governor RBI, other officials from the RBI, university officials, Professor K. Ratnavali, Dean Academic Affairs, University of Delhi, Director DSC, Professor Pamidua, Professor Andita Datta, Kamai, Dr. Kamai Ofan, Sociology Department, and other colleagues, students, and guests. So it, I feel honored and privileged in proposing this vote of thanks on this special occasion when we have this special lecture or distinguished lecture by the RBI governor, which is of special significance for the DSC community. This DSC Diamond Jubilee distinguished lecture by Sri Sakti Kanta Das, governor RBI on art of monetary policy making, the Indian experience has been very insightful and full of learnings. And it is a great opportunity for all of us to learn the nuances of the monetary policy in the country in practice. Not from just the top central banker of the country, but the top central banker of the world. And I can say that RBI or our monetary policy in that way is able to provide us a role model, especially in abnormal times by using not just conventional instruments, but unconventional instruments in a unique, forward-looking, responsible way. So thank you so much, sir. So on behalf of the DSC community, I express my sincere thanks to Sri Sakti Kanta Das for taking time out to, for this lecture and gracing the occasion and extend my regards to him. I also express my sincere gratitude to the guests and colleagues who are attending this lecture from various institutions. And lastly, I express my sincere gratitude to Professor Dua. It is her sincere efforts and engagement that this lecture could be possible. I'm also thankful to my colleagues from both teaching and non-teaching especially the director of his staff for organizing this event. And in an educational institute, nothing is possible without the active participation and involvement of the students. So I'm very grateful to my dear students. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your word of thanks. Before we close the event, I would like to call everyone on the dais together for a family photo on this momentous occasion of Teacher's Day.
Thank you so much. I thank all our audience members, esteemed faculty, and all our guests for their pre for their presence on today's event. All the guests and faculty are requested to move to room number 107 for refreshments on the first floor. I request everyone else to be seated and move in an orderly fashion. Thank you.